The Dan York State of Mind program is brought to you at part by Lookout Rhode Island and Taco Comfort Solutions. I often say as Providence goes, so goes Rhode Island. And as Rhode Island goes, so goes Providence. It's probably the former more than the latter. And the city of Providence has a lot happening right now. Some issues cross over to the entire state's interest, I'm quite certain. And we're going to get into it tonight. Dan McGowan, who covers Providence like no other journalist here in the community on WPRI.com and Eyewitness News, of course, is here to kind of hit uh, to a bunch of different fields. It's always great when, when Dan comes in. And uh, sometimes we've got to kind of, oh, well, what's going on in the city? Tonight it's like, what's, what's not going on in the city in terms of news and things happening? Let's, uh, let's start from um, a couple of days ago. We still, by the way, don't have a ratified contract. I guess that's paperwork. I'm hoping that's just paperwork on the bus strike, but you'll remember the headline. Now we had Mayor Lorza in on this conversation and he talked to us about why this was the case. Here was the summary when it was available earlier this week on Eyewitness News. As children boarded their school buses in Providence Monday morning, all sides were relieved. Today went great. Um, everything went smooth. You know, these are professional drivers. They know their job. And now we're learning more about how your taxpayer dollars were spent as the striking bus drivers and the busing company first student came to a settlement Friday. The mayor's office says they agreed to give 600,000 taxpayer dollars to first student. The idea was to avert a strike. It's the amount the city would have paid if bus service had been provided the last 11 school days. Uh, normally under the contract, if they don't provide service, they don't get paid. But uh, we've been informed that uh, by putting up that money, the city helped facilitate uh, the settlement. City Councilor Sam Zurier, who is chair of the School Department Oversight Committee, said they'll now review the settlement and how taxpayer dollars were spent. He wants to see the details of the contract. They will uh, come to our committee and then we'll have a chance to review it because uh, it would be a shame to uh, pay extra money to resolve this situation and find ourselves in a similar situation 12 months from now. Uh, yeah, Dan McGowan is here. By the way, you're not David Cicilline. You don't look like David Cicilline. <laughs> we had told you uh, last night that David Cicilline was coming tonight. He's actually taping on the Thursday. We, on Thursday, we taped two shows, one on Thursday, one for Friday. Uh, and he will be on tomorrow's show. He's so, the former mayor. I'm kind of like the mayor now. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. <laughs> and maybe you're even going to be the assistant uh, leader, <laughs> you know, at some juncture. I hope not. <laughs> Are you announcing a plan? Is no. there some kind of... Only, uh, only when, when you leave and you can run the campaign. Only trans... This is going to be a major <laughs> professional transaction or transition going on here. Um, you cover the bus strike intimately. That was a weird ending. Yeah. It was very weird. It was one of those things that... that Let uh, us make you whole so you can make a deal, even though we're saying this is about you and, and another party and we're really not involved. Yeah, this was the classic thing that, in fairness to, I think, the administration, they wanted to get rid of this strike. It had to go away. And so they were in this spot of these two sides that are negotiating, negotiating. The only thing the mayor could do is say, yeah, we'll give, we'll give you back the money that we, uh, we weren't paying you. I mean, that was basically the offer on the table, and that's what happened. This contract, and maybe others now, need to be reviewed for its uh, force majeure yes. language, meaning, uh, you know, how, how often do companies get a chance to kind of get off the hook on non-performance for issues that involve employees? I don't know how many... Uh, contractual uh, three-way type of deals we yeah. have in the city right now, meaning the city has a contract with an entity that then has its own negotiation right, with yeah. its employees. Are it's there others? Rare. Um, the, only one, the only one I could think of is, I believe, with food service employees in the schools, you mm -hmm. have something going on there, too. Um, but, you know, generally speaking, it's a contractual agreement between the city and you know the firefighters union or the police union. Are we going to learn anything from this exercise? Or are we going to be put in a position where it's just, you know, we'll touch up the language and hope like heck this never happens again? Or is some of the conversation about changing the way we transport kids, reassign them, neighborhood schools, all so, that kind of stuff? Is that is that going to come into play? So I think everybody wants to have the conversation. That certainly, school officials, let's say the superintendent. Um, he would say, oh, I think we need to revisit uh, neighborhood schooling, things like that. My gut is very little is going to change. I think that this company has been the bus provider for a long time. Um, you start to get into this neighborhood school conversation, but you know, tell the folks in South Providence with struggling schools that 
they should be going to their neighborhood school rather than going to Vartan Gregorian for elementary school on the east side. It's a much more difficult conversation to have. Um, and, and so I, I highly doubt that you're going to see significant change come from this. What is the blend of, of students crisscrossing across the state? I it, mean, across the city. I mean, it's significant. It's, you know, if you, if you look, use the Vartan Gregorian example, because that's the high, you know, high performing elementary school on the east side. I think only 15% of the kids are from the neighborhood that go there. And so you're talking about it happening across the city, and there's a high level of school choice. So, you know, when you, when you have a, a, a child, you come in and you look at what school you want to go to, you basically rank them. And so it's, it's not uncommon at all to seek to go to school across the city. But you, 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 as a for instance, you said the South Side parents, you know, would have a qualm. Uh, are the South Side schools performing at a much lesser yes. rate? Yes. Yeah, I mean, I think all schools... Because they have more kids in the neighborhood going there? Because they're of lower socioeconomic... Uh, I would say the socioeconomic plays a big role into it. I mean, what happens is there's high demand for one or two schools, or maybe three schools, at the elementary level. But then there's a lot of kids, so they end up being filtered into some of the lower performing schools. One of the biggest problems you have is in the middle school, because really none of them are particularly strong, maybe with the exception of Nathan Bishop on the east side. It's a complex it's issue. It's got to be an administrative nightmare to be zigzagging thousands of kids across oh, the city. Hence why you pay $35 million for bus uh, services over the course of three years. Yeah, I think right? that's right. Yeah. Uh, and then there was the issue of what the bus drivers actually got and what they settled for. Here was Nick Williams from the Teamsters Union trying to explain that the other night got with a defined cont uh, contribution into our Northern New England uh, Savings and Investment Pension Fund um, at the rate of 50 cents per hour uh, for every employee. There is no employee opt-in. In the previous agreement, we had a 401k where, with a match where the employee had to put the money up first and then for a student would match. Um, well, in, 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 except for the cases where they didn't. Mm. So now uh, my members don't have to put up any money. First student automatically puts 50 cents an hour, every hour worked, into that pension fund. So that negotiation was an interesting one. The Teamsters would like to spin that they got the pension, the Teamsters pension that they were looking for. Right. They didn't. They didn't. No. No, they got what they did get, and, and Nick Williams is exactly right about that, that they basically got first student to contribute into a fund that is controlled by the union, by the Teamsters. Before it was controlled by uh, first student going into, I believe, a Wells Fargo account. I think that's what Mr. But Williams it's said. pension light, meaning it's the Teamsters managed 401k replica. Right, right. Meaning defined benefit is as simple as a defined contribution, which is what they've locked into, means you know exactly what's going to be put in. Right. right? But um, the, the challenge with that, of course, right, this is the whole the, the argument that we've talked about for a long time. The defined benefit means you retire, you know what you're getting. The defined contribution is money's going in, but if the market doesn't play well, you're right. in trouble. Well, that's what everybody, that's what that most have, people yeah. in America are, are dealing with. That's right. All right. So moral of the story in that whole bus strike is what? Well, I mean, it, it was a difficult situation. It's one that pops up every, I don't know, 10 years or so, um, maybe a little bit more frequent than that. but. Uh, it's a, there needs to be a little bit more oversight over the contracts from the city side, and I think I would venture to guess you're going to have the same dispute four years from now when this contract comes up because there's always going to be that friction between management and labor. All right, when we come back, we will uh, take a look at the politics. We do have a race, and some say it's a very formidable race. I have no way of knowing. I wonder if Dan does. Stay with us. I haven't looked at their contract. I know that they want more money. Yeah. And I know that the teachers need to be paid to do the work that they're doing. Well, you, pardon me. I know, I know you're looking for... Well, but no, but I don't know how you run for mayor uh, criticizing the current mayor for not doing a job on the contract and you haven't even read the contract. I... I mean, that doesn't sound like a serious run for mayor to Oh, me. that's a very serious run for mayor. And I'm not privy to the nuts and bolts of the contract. I don't know what to make of Dee Dee Whitman as a candidate for mayor. She's obviously a, a bright woman. Um, she's had an interesting life. 
she's, she tells an interesting story as to why she's decided yeah. to get into this race, after having lost her husband, and then kind of a message came to her, and uh, it's moving. But I don't think she's, it doesn't seem to me that she's done a whole lot of work. Yeah, she's got a math problem, just simply. I mean, she's from the east side where she thinks she can pull up votes because she's from there and because she's you know been entrenched in that community and I think her challenge is, is that the mayor has dominated the east side I mean to as well or better than Gina Raimondo in many cases um, and so if you can't come off the east side relatively close you can't you're not even you don't have a chance across the rest of the city because the votes aren't there and so uh, she's got a real problem unless she can, you know, in the last two or three weeks, you know, I think turn people on Alorza, uh, on the mayor, and, and, and that's a very difficult thing to do unless something unforeseen happens. And it, seemed like, it seems like her support is it's not 100%. For instance, Joe Palino, the former mayor, we know has been kind of marketing her mm -hmm. around, yet on the radio yesterday wouldn't go so far as to endorse her. Yeah. It's not full throttle. And yeah. he actually said uh, on the air on WPRO, uh, I believe with uh, Terry yesterday, yeah. that he was surprised that she got into this race. Yeah, I mean, look, he's, it, it is fairly clear based on who has donated from the Palino family to her uh, that he is supportive of her. I would venture to, I'd make a bet with you that he's gonna vote for her. Um, but he's, he's also the national committee man as a Democrat, so it's a hard thing for him to take a side there. He also recognizes that his support um, gives some credibility to, to her, but it also turns a lot of people off. He, he endorsed in a council race this year, this year, and the candidate only got 100 votes. So um, he has issues there, and so I think he's trying to stay out of it. In the meantime, uh, reportedly she's put in a half a million dollars yeah. into her campaign. I don't know that she's spending a half no, a million dollars. No, she hasn't dollars. spent it yet. That's, That's right. You know. That's the key. It's, you, can, you can loan yourself right. uh, your campaign some money and take it back right. after it's done. Well, when, I, when I run for mayor, I'm going to put in a half a million just so I could be on your show and talk to you about it. That's twice tonight. <laughs> uh, two different races, by the way. <laughs> but Alan Hassenfeld mm -hmm. kicked in some dough. Yeah. We got a headline here. Uh, there's a you know PAC supportive type of organization that's uh, supporting her campaign, and it was a pretty tough ad yeah. that that came out on her behalf. What up with that? Yeah, I mean, so there's two parts of it, right? So one is just the the fact that it's on TV, so more people start to see it. But the name Alan Hassenfeld throw, throwing his you know money into it is very interesting. I mean, he's a guy who's been very critical of this mayor. Um, I think he had a pretty good relationship with the last mayor, Angel Taveras. No secret that Angel Taveras and Mara Lorza don't love each other. Um, I think Alan Hassenfeld has made the case that the city should go into bankruptcy, and uh, Mayor Lorza has kind of poo-pooed that idea. And so you've got a situation where he, he wants to back somebody else. But $50,000, real money to put into a, a, you know, a third-party ad. Do we have any sense? Has there been any polling out there to, to, to indicate whether she has a chance or no. whether the unfavorables for Alorza give a, 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 a well-funded, albeit late, but well-funded competitor a chance? I think, remember, uh, I believe you had John Lombardi on when he was flirting with running, and he pulled right. the race. And I think the city councilman, uh, the former city council president, former interim mayor, yeah, now state representative state on Federal Hill. That's yes. right. Yeah, he and he pulled it, and I think he found what he believed was Mayor Lorza has support, but it's soft. Problem is, is that soft support is still support until you turn, you know, you turn people, and uh, we haven't quite seen that yet. And I don't know that there's enough time to do it. And what I'm conf uh, confused over is what she stands for. Right. I mean, what what, what is it that she's she, her, she's made a big headline. Well, she certainly has tried to take advantage of the education stuff, both in the teacher's contract without reading it, as, as she said to you, um, and the bus strike. Um, I think sh her big splash of an idea it was to uh, get rid of the speed cameras, which you know makes certain people very, uh, very happy. But what do you stand for is the better question. I moderated a debate between them, and um, it was a lot of this city you know, is run down and terrible. Um, in a room of people who, I think I said this to you, in a room of people who pay $1,500 a month in rent, people like the city of Providence that were in that room. They're happy with, with downtown. And so she hasn't quite made that connection to say, not only is the city not doing well, here's why I can do better.
Hmm. Okay, when we come back, we'll talk about the mayor's tactic in this, including doubling, tripling, quadrupling down on this sanctuary thing. Stay with us. You know, I've had my differences with the Trump administration's policy on immigration, but what really did it for me was the child separation policy at the border. It is heartless, it is cruel, it is anti-American, uh, anti and it's counterproductive. And so, you know, we can't have a federal agency that's role is separating children, lying about it, and keeping, keeping those kids away from their parents. It just, it, 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 it's not who we are. We are so much better than that. And that's what did it for me. On top of that, you know, I've said very proudly, we're a sanctuary city here in Providence. Our police department will never be a federal immigration force. Buzzword. <laughs> Classic buzzword. Uh, why is he doing that? My gut is polling shows that, that liberals like that. That's, I think that's number one. Um, I think Meaning he, the east side likes that. Yes. Uh, I think the whole city in, in many, uh, m many parts of the city. Certainly the east side, south side connection that helps you win the mayoral race. But um, I also think he actually does believe in it. I think he's a guy who has been pretty clear that he, be that he wants Providence to be branded as a sanctuary city. By the way, very different than the last two mayors. Both David Cicilline and Angel Tavares did not want that brand. Um, but he then also always reminds we follow all immigration laws. We cooperate with ICE, things like that. So, well, I gave a the big speech on the radio yesterday about what's going on with this sanctuary buzzword. You take the city of Providence, all their protocols and all the way they do business is exactly akin to what, say, like the city of Cranston That's is right. doing. That's right. Yet the mayor of Cranston, who's running for governor, is suggesting that Rhode Island will never be a sanctuary city, and look at my police department as evidence. And, right. and resume for such, but he, spinning non-sanctuary with the same protocols in the police department that the city of Providence is. The only difference is that he signed a piece of paper to the yeah. administration that says, "Hey, we'll fingerprint and turn to ICE right. any any felonious criminal that comes through here." That's kind of a ad lib on it, but uh, it, you you said something to me that they think is pretty smart. I was talking about it being a brand. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the same data and say I'm a sanctuary guy, and then he's going to use the same data and say he's a non-sanctuary guy, right. and people don't know what to make of it. Well, it, it's really about... It's about what the polls say. And emotion. And emotion. Oh, yeah, yeah, absolutely, totally. Yeah. It's, it's about a, feeling. It's, it's a feeling. It is. And then if you look at what Mayor Fung did, particularly in the primary, remember, remember, he's dancing around, he's not coming on television, he's not talking to anyone, puts out ads about sanctuary cities. That polls well among Republicans. We're going to crack down. That's his big message. Mayor Lorza, flip side, in Providence, in a city that's heavily Democratic, heavily liberal, hev heavily Latino, says, we are a sanctuary city. It works. It's a feeling. You're right. It's 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 a tale of There's the no same story. There's no statutory definition That's for right. sanctuary. It's it's a it's it's a borrowed term, mm -hmm. and it's a term that people use at their whim and at their at their pleasure and convenience. The, I, I feel for the law enforcement types, the, the the chiefs of police, and we have. I think they're mm -hmm. outstanding chiefs of police in both the city. A Providence and in Cranston, who probably just roll their eyes over the politics of this whole thing. They do. I can tell. I'm sure that they do. And I think that one of the things that's really interesting about it, too, is this is the first time, at least in my time covering Providence, that we have mayors, including Mayor Lorza, who are embracing the sanctuary city tagline. Because you're right, I think in the past what's happened, even if cities are following kind of the same protocol, Sanctuary City has been used by, you know, uh, real hardline immigration reformers to say this is a bad thing. It's bad if you were labeled a sanctuary city. And this is the first time we're seeing a mayor kind of step up, and it's not the only one. Mayors across the state or the country doing that. We only have a few minutes. There's a thing happening right now in the city, which is we've got this gentleman who uh, has been released from prison. Well, I think we have some audio on this. Do we have something on this? I think we do. He does not belong in our city. He does not belong in our community. So that's Mayor Lorza last night running into a community meeting where people were nuts and then, and, then, and then went to the street and went to the address of this guy who just moved in who precedes Megan's Law, mm -hmm. who only had to privately notify the police department that he was moving in as a former convicted sex offender. Um, 
Somebody, little birdie in the police department told the neighborhood person that he was living there. And now, as we speak, another plan for this evening to shout him out of there. And Alors is leading the band yeah. and actually saying there'll be 24-7 monitoring of the guy. Where's that in the budget? Yeah, don't know where it is in the budget. Uh, I've asked, and they're still calculating what it will cost. That was a spur of the moment. Mayor showed up raucous crowd i'm gonna tell everyone i don't know if you would say it's a mayoral race kind of thing or if it's just the mayor had a lot of adrenaline in a hot room and decided to say something but that was not a planned statement last night i can say for sure he just pinned that responsibility on the police department as he sat next to major le Payton, who i could probably feel his uh, blood boiling well i looked at his i looked at his face le Payton was more or less uh okay now, look, they'll figure it out. They'll find a way to put someone in the neighborhood, and they'll have them drive around, and they'll say it's community policing, and it won't be the end of the world, I'm sure. But what, at what point, and believe me, this is why the Megan's Law thing and, and, and the whole thing, I mean, my, my view has been throw the key away with this kind, of, this kind of offense. Throw the key away. But this is what drives people to drink. This is why Megan's Law, you know, levels one, two, and three, I mean, housing values go to heck. Uh, people end up seeing shrinks, right. uh, there's panic ensuing, and then the notion, God forbid, there's a civil liberties issue involved here. Yeah. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna trail this guy and surveil this guy with no cause? Yeah. I would venture to guess. I don't think that's constitutional. No, I, it was my exact question. I was in a city council meeting last night and just watching on Twitter, and that was my question. Is this legal? Is this something that you can actually do? Um, I, I would venture to guess the ACLU will at some point weigh in. In the meantime, are you allowed to raise your voice with women? Oof, interesting story there. I mean, did you kind of hold your nose and write this story? Uh, this is Salvatore Female Colleagues headline, if you have that. Uh, thanks, Jess. Uh, Dan had to write this stupid story. Uh, he raised his voice. He was dissing. He was, we only have uh, 35, 40 seconds here. What in the heck happened? Yeah, this is something that I'll be honest with you, and I, I said this uh, to the council president. I don't know that I would have written about it if he didn't put out a very long statement. Admitting I raised to my voice um, with two female counselors over a women's issue that he thought he was championing, and they just wanted to, what, touch up. Yeah, this is a race for council president that's playing out. And that doesn't actually even involve him. It just involves who he supports. And on the other side of this, uh, Councilwoman Matos is really making a strong play. This comes down to politics more so than any women issues, I think. He's not running for the council presidency? Uh, he hasn't said that officially, but he is, uh, I believe he's lining up behind another candidate, like huh. another councilwoman. Well, you better be careful. I mean, there's a, the Me Too movement is real, but come on, man. Yeah. Man. It was an interesting, I mean, it was one of those things that was uh, tough to write about, but uh, again, he puts out a statement, you kind of want to tell everyone where things stand. Interesting times. If you need to know anything about the city of Providence, start with PRI.com and Dan McGowan. Uh, he'll be announcing for some office uh, shortly. All the offices. Thank you. Final word and we come back. <laughs>